Thanks. So I know what they, I told the conference I was going to do here was a talk. What I'm actually doing here today is dropping a zero day in full disclosure. So we're doing a new experiment and a full disclosure. So if you are not comfortable with full disclosure and messing with things, please, please leave now. Other than that, there is no warnings or anything for this talk. We're going full into it. We're going all in because I want you guys to learn some new cool things on what we do for red team engagements and other things when we have to break into places. So at Insider, we do things a little differently. With red teaming, we may have to be embedded for up to two years at a time somewhere, and we need to maintain cover, we need to maintain persistence, we need to maintain our access into things. I'm gonna show you guys how to do some of that stuff with some of the toys that are out there on the market, common objects that are fun. On top of that, on the flip side, the blue team, don't worry, I haven't left you out. At the end of it, I'm gonna show you how to block some of this stuff and defend against some of it. So just real quickly, I uh, work for Insider Agency. If you guys want to know about who I am and what I do for a living, uh, just reach out to me after this. We do not have time because I want to get into a lot of stuff with you guys. So I want you guys to think about right now that if you joined uh, or went into college in the 80s, you were taught through graphic design and design that you should have a uh, amount of space in whatever you were designing available for future expansion, for upgrades unused space. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, that was a great and grand idea that everything we would make in engineer and manufacture would be able to be expanded, upgraded indefinitely, and you'd have to buy one thing once and that was it. Never worked that way. However, the mentality stayed throughout the years. And there's always a pocket of space in consumer products that's left over or designed intentionally. For the last few years, the averaging sample that we found is about 30% of that object that you bought off the shelf has unused space in that. And that's not unused space. That's a bad phrase. That's a bad word. That's potential for you to conduct attacks. That's potential for you to use that device as your own Trojan horse. So today kind of comes full circle. I unofficially spoke at the first B-sides by getting into a lot of trouble. What you don't know about the first B-Sides is it was part of a thing called Cyber Raid, where we had red versus blue. And a few years back, I tried to figure out what I wanted to do, because I knew that Kansas City had some of the most badass hackers on the planet. I was intimidated. I didn't know what to do. I felt that the only thing I knew what to do and the only talent I had was graphic design and social engineering. So I decided to attack this at a very different level. Got into a lot of trouble and did not make any friends with InfraGuard, FBI, and some other folks, which we'll get into. <laughs> but this was one of the most cool things ever, was a red versus blue capture the flag. It was at a hotel downtown, which was awesome, and it was a large space in the public that allowed us to get away with a lot of stuff. So one thing I thought immediately of is I can use trust models to violate and, and get a, an advantage over everyone. What I mean by trust models is, you go out on the street, you don't buy bread from this dude. You go to the store because you inherently trust that the store has USDA ratings on everything, everything's packaged, everything's fresh, they keep their best interests and your best interests at heart. This dude has a better deal for you, but your trust models and what you've built over time and risk modeling says don't. You go to the store. So we take for granted things that are packaged. We always hear think outside the box, that's bullshit. Think inside the box. We all accept the boxes. We all are susceptible to that gimmick and, gimmick and marketing of a box. We know that if it's vacuum sealed, if one of those things has a clamshell, you know those clamshells are horrible. You, you pretty much cut yourself open trying to open it and you destroy whatever's inside trying to get at it, but it effectively keeps you out. You trust that that thing in that clamshell is safe and secure. So I had to figure out something and how to violate some trust models and get an advantage over everyone in this cyber raid game. So with social engineering, I decided to take apart some things and put some things together. I gave the blue team USB sticks because I knew they had to move updates from one computer to another <coughs> during the contest. So what I did ahead of time is took a tour and did a job interview at this hotel ahead of time before the game so I could get a tour of the facility, learn the design aesthetics of what was being used and how everything fit into place. Also learn how uh, job schedules and shift changes happened at the hotel. 
I went at 4 a.m. the game, day of the tournament, dressed in a suit and tie, picked the lock to the blue team room, put everything in the blue team room, and I'll show the other devices I created and put in there, and walked away, went to the parking lot, changed into a hoodie and jeans, and waited for the game to start. Now, the great thing about this in this picture is this was all done for free. How I did full color printing, holograms, and plastic clamshells for free is I asked for free samples. I called manufacturers up and was like, hey, I have a client I'm trying to convince to use the clamshell technology. I'm not going to shell out for 500 clamshells. But you know what? I'll give you 20 bucks for postage to get a free sample. Why don't you send me some boxes and clamshells in the approximate size? If you want to have a heart attack, go find a hologram manufacturer, write for free samples. You will get voting machine tamper resistant labels, all sorts of stuff back from the holograms. And as you see on this packaging, the holograms had nothing to do with anything, but they were there and they were a validation point. Ultimately, what was on there was a, a variant of poison ivy I created. And something went wrong because during the tournament, it was about lunchtime, and nothing happened. So we all broke for lunch at, at, at uh, Cyber 8, and we went about our business talking and, and figuring out, and I felt like a total asshole. <laughs> because no one told me at Cyber 8 that we were using virtual machines on per people's personal laptops. And I didn't want to be that guy that blew up everyone's computers. I also figured out I needed some FUD. So after lunch, I went up to Bill, who is a peer, and the nice lady at Infragard, who was an FBI agent, agent that had no sense of humor, and talked to them and said, hey, I did a really bad thing. I put USB sticks into play that are infected. I don't want to be the bad guy that blows up someone's personal computer. Can you please take them out of play? She didn't understand what I was saying, went into the blue team room and held up the package and asked me, is this one of them? It was empty. I was like, yes, and we need to find that now. Long story short, they didn't appreciate the craftsmanship of putting <laughs> logos in, of putting many different mechanisms and controls, including serial numbers that matched everything that said, hey, don't use this if it's sealed, we give instructions. But it's something you trust, and something you know, and it is sealed. And it took an act of God, Allah, and Buddha to get that thing open, because it's a clamshell. So you know it's safe and it wouldn't come, Later on, afterwards, Bill and several others told me that they thought that sponsors had brought these in and dropped them off in the room while they weren't looking. Mm -hmm. But we preyed upon the fact of it's something you trust and something's familiar to you. And it's something that's always around, and you know where it's coming from, it's safe. The other thing I needed to do is I needed to figure out how password changes happened, <laughs> and I needed to figure out how and what was going on in the other room. Well, I could put a bug in there, but, well, I didn't want to violate the FCC <coughs> arrangements and get the FBI angry at me. I also am cheap. I had a budget of, like, $12. So how would you keep a listening device on the whole time at a hacking contest? You combine a baby monitor and a power strip, because everyone needs power strips for a hacking contest. And, like I said earlier, there's 30% unused space in most products in this day and age, so you can put anything you want in there. The great thing was, is tying the baby monitor directly to the power rail, it had power the whole time. So I could hear every single combination of Family Guy <laughs> cartoon names for the passwords, Star Wars names, and other things, and Kansas City Royals names. Uh, a guy later on on the blue team came up to me afterwards when he saw me collecting all this stuff back and said, you know, I cried today. This was single most horrible, trying experience I've had in my IT career. I was like, well, that's what it's like in the real world, so we're trying to make it that way. The great thing about this was, is when we're finished with the product, that's what it looks like. You throw on a label maker that says, do not remove from this room or property of the hotel, it's not going anywhere, and you're listening to everything and anything that happens in the room. But more importantly, I want you to look at this again, and if you saw this under your desk, what would you do? What's the first thing you do? Yeah, you use it. You don't expect it to sit there and snitch on you and collect data or do other horrible things. But did you see how much space was in there? That's, that's a lot of free space in there we can play with and do all sorts of stuff. For your information, three Raspberry Pis fit in there. <laughs> and I 
I was not allowed to do another cyber raid. <laughs> so, but you see now why I'm kind of concerned and why we do things, we attack at a level of what you're familiar with. Think inside the box and use the stuff that's out there. Don't go out and get gimmicky stuff and do all this crazy stuff. The stuff that's underneath your desk is the stuff you're not looking at. And that's where we put the bad stuff in and trick you. So, what about these things? You know what these are? I, I did this out in California and showed this picture. People didn't know what it was. I had to explain to them we had mice in the Midwest. And such. <laughs> Do you mess with these at all under your desk? Oh. Who touches one? Who's opened one? Who's actually looked inside of one? No one, because you don't want to know what really is under there. And those of you that have opened it up, it's, it's amazing what's in there and what you can put in there. But you're assured that no one will mess with it. If you guys are in IT or architecture and you're not in security, and you have problems with <coughs> pardon me, items walking away, put them in the mouse traps, the bait traps. You'll be guaranteed people will walk away with stuff. So we start thinking about all these things and these avenues and these objects out there that we can co-opt and start creating weapons rather than, hey, this is a USB stick. Wrong, now it's a weapon. And we use those in red teaming to go in and help get an advantage and bypass security mechanisms that we go in through. And you'll hear me utter the P word a lot today, but we create policies and education to follow up to make sure that you understand why you don't tailgate and tailgating's bad now. Well, with tailgating, I like using a move. I like to go out and I sit in your smoking areas of your offices. And I'll sit there and smoke and smoke and smoke and smoke until I find the right person and I will tailgate them in. The reason why I do this is it's so simple and it is the fundamentals of human behavior that you can easily exploit. People are off their guard smoking. You can see certain behaviors. The young kid who sits there and looks around as he smokes and then puts out the cigarette like he's doing a touchdown and showboats off, you don't want to follow that individual because he's aware of what you're doing. However, I want the guy who has the Unix mode that is coffee stained and has long hair and chokes down like five cigarettes in about two minutes. Because he doesn't care who's around him or who's following him back in. Long story short, I love doing this technique because it's so simple. But something happened a couple years ago. And I was screwed. I sat out there on day number three looking like a total creep on your campus, sitting there going, where's the IT guys? Where is everyone? Why am I this sole creepy smoking guy on this campus? So then I saw everyone come home from lunch, back to their cubes, in the office, and everyone came in with the vaporizers. And I was like, oh, there's smoke-free campuses. I am a dinosaur. I can't do this technique in social engineering anymore. Smoking areas don't work. What am I going to do? Again, I'm going to think inside the box, and I'm going to take some objects that are common every day that you're probably sitting there, and I know several of you are in the audience right now with these objects, and we use these objects to attack the company. So much so that I had to create a handler and proxy for the amount of Metasploit shells that came back. <laughs> There's a lot of space inside of vaporizers. <laughs> so what we did is created a vaporizer, uh, we created a payload based off the glitch model. There are six payloads it can dump off based upon the environment it picks up. When plugged in, it registers as an HID device, not a USB. So it never pops up. So how do you get this into the environment? Well, you go to Hooters. You talk to the nice young ladies and tell them that Camel Cigarettes is getting into the vaporizer game and here are a bunch of t-shirts and polo shirts that you found at Goodwill, don't worry. It's totally legit. You then put together an action-based modeling contract for the young ladies. You train them and pay them $500 a piece to have a lot of fun. Since Camel Cigarettes is getting back into the vape game and trying to take over, the nice young ladies go at lunchtime and hand out the free vape samples to everyone coming back in from lunch, which is cool. You got a free vape from Camel, everything, the packaging's legit. And what do you know, there's no wall outlet plug into this packaging. And what do you know, the batteries are all run down. So now you've got to run in and plug it in somewhere to charge. So what do you do? That USB port on your computer charger stuff. So you plug it in. And one of six payloads comes in and whacks your machine. But 
you sit there and you think about it, and we come back from a blue team perspective from policy, why don't you have a policy prohibiting the importation of alien devices or foreign objects? Why do your employees need to be bringing things in and plugging them in? Quite simply, they don't. There's no excuses anymore in this day and age. And things are dangerous now, which we'll show you. So I'm out of Colorado and Denver, and things are a little different law-wise with legalization of objects. And what's funny is people saw the research I did with this, and some of the manufacturers got wise to this and decided to change some things. And someone decided to taunt me and said, you know what, we heard your talk, we heard your discussion and your advice in the white paper. Guess what? We've got you. We fooled you. We reduced the size available for you to play with stuff. So this is a marijuana vaporizer that's quite popular out in Denver. And the manufacturer's like, ha-ha, no space inside to do stuff. What are you going to do now, kid? I bet you can't use this to go out and break in somewhere. You know what's awesome? They have their own apps and APIs that are open. <laughs> why, I don't know, but why for some reason your marijuana vaporizer needs to play games with your friend's marijuana vaporizer. I don't know why. So as a result, they have open APIs and they have open software and their apps in the App Store are horrible. It's easy for you now to piggyback this thing and backdoor it. So, we're taking the USB train even further. How many of you saw these at DEF CON this year? <clears throat> we had a series of DEF CON USBs that we tested. Every single one was picked up, every single one was executed and played with. It was kind of scary. But what we started doing with USB sticks is we've always heard the stories about people in the parking lot. You know, we drop them in the parking lot and people plug them in and that's how it works. That's stupid. What happens when you drop something in the parking lot? It gets taken into lost and found, or the front desk, or the security, and no one's going to touch it. So we started changing things to help get you to entice and pick up USB sticks, because if you just throw them out there, no one cares. You throw out DEF CON branded USB sticks, people pick them up, plug them in. Uh, you can be very, very mean and find things that people want to pick up. The minion ones are great. The more desirable the object or the cooler looking it is, people pick it up. You do these minions and you throw a payroll.xls file on these guys, but we try to throw out a parking lot, it will get plugged in within about seven hours. Just because it's a novelty shape, it attracts attention, and more people psychologically are thinking and rationalizing to themselves that they're not stealing it, they're going to take it home for their kids or someone else who can appreciate that object. Micro Center here in town hates me, but has several options and cools different varieties of things from superheroes to pink mustaches, which work for Lyft, and several other things that work for local businesses. But the key thing is, start creating them and using them that look uh, more enticing. The other thing is, you hear about dropping in the parking lot. Don't do that, because it doesn't look natural. I go up to a vending machine. I have a USB stick in my pocket. I act like I'm putting a quarter in, and I'll drop the USB stick during that motion so it falls and rests like it fell out of my pocket naturally. The other place that's the best to do USB sticks is in the restroom at a stall, because it looks like it fell out of my pocket naturally through the progression of me walking around. That's where you want to put USB sticks. That's where you want to drop them inside places where they are safe, and you yourself rationalizing, man, I know someone sitting down at the toilet, things fall out of their pockets, that's where this fell out. If it's out in the parking lot, I know someone's testing. That's the thing now, is nine times out of 10, we do a test and the client wants us to do a parking lot drop, and we still have to do it, it'll always get caught because people hear those stories now. <coughs> so you need to evolve them, entice them. But what happens if you drop something in the parking lot and it got picked up by security? How could you use that? We'll get to that, but also for here, for you guys, for conferences, <coughs> swag is awesome. How many of you have the Mr. Robot figure here? Well, several people at a, a conference got them. They don't exist because there's no Funko that has USB, but still, an entire information security department 
was excited because it was Mr. Robot, and they plugged them all in. <laughs> And we have a demo fail. So if you drop something in the parking lot and you want people to get a hold of it and you want it to be able to be used, we have some friends in South Korea that started making us these USB sticks. And as you look at them, they look like USBs. However, they do 20 hours of audio recording based off of sound. Mm -hmm. What's great about that is you drop that in the parking lot now. Your guards and everyone take it in, it's sitting at Lost and Found, it's now sitting at the guard station, you listen to the guards. How do you retrieve that? You go have your friend who's much cuter looking than you go in and go, hey, mister, I dropped this, it's exactly white color, can you give it, since it's in the Lost and Found. Meanwhile, you have all the guards reported and the protocols and all sorts of fun stuff. So USB attacks are great, and we're still kind of in the generic realm of, okay, we all know that USB you can be attacked with it, it's easy to understand what it is. But let's start getting into some stuff that you may not see, but you see every day. What's this? This is a wall outlet where you can plug in, now you have USB options. Well, on this, we can still attach USB connections A, B, and C, so we have data. This is only meant for power. However, we can connect that data connection, and how much space behind a wall. There's a lot of stuff that we could hook up into that. And you know what? Those are really great and convenient for your waiting room or your lobby. Think of how many people pass through there. How many people are checking your lobby? When's the last time you checked the network connections and power jacks at your company's lobby to see if they're alive and you can make a connection on how far you can get? There's a lot of room behind a wall. I can have, this is like a, this world of fun to me back here. And I can hook it up to there because there's A, B, and C. So we enable the data on that. Go to the airports. Now start thinking about that at the airports. So think about some horrible person had to go and install a lot of these around the airports and around the country. And all it takes is that one wire to connect that data channel. So how many of you have seen these? Cell phone charging stations. Do you know what they are? They're great services provided by manufacturers or others that allow you to deposit your phone, get a charge, and pick it up safely. They even lock now, so they're totally safe. <laughs> see, you can see up there, they're totally safe. They got locks. The crazy thing is the one in the center costs about 800 bucks. And I can brand it with any logo I want, drop it off on the front desk at your business. The great thing about these is these already come pre-programmed, shipped, and installed with malware. Mm. Because they provide an incentive package for you to collect metrics on who's plugging in. Or you can push out ads, as they call them, to people's phones. So a lot of these things already have basically a malware channel built into them. But it doesn't take much for you to put stuff in there and roll your own. You see these things all over. KCI has a bunch of them. Please do not use the ones at KCI or MCI, whatever it's called. Please don't use those at the airport. <laughs> but it doesn't take much for you to roll one of those in and wreak total havoc. And it's hard for you to talk to your employees and go, hey, don't use this. Because this is familiar and easy to use and it's there for your convenience. And free. And you need to get it out in front of your employees with policies. Don't treat policies like a weapon, treat policies as marching orders. These are your instructions and marching orders to avoid problems and things. <clears throat> when people go out to conferences like where you're at now, you guys are very vulnerable and susceptible to all sorts of attacks, including the stuff that I'm showing you right now. Having policies in place helps you to prevent this stuff and identify this stuff because there's all sorts of things and attack channels. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what year it is, that's a Trojan horse. The technology and everything behind it has never changed. We just changed the avenue. So that's all crazy and all great. But what if I wanted to own an entire information security department by using the SANS Institute? What is this? This is a sync stop. Do you guys, have you encountered those? It's supposed to basically prevent your USB from being bad, prevent channels from being activated. Basically, it assures your USB is going to only charge power. 
There's no way to tamper with those, right? There's no way to open those up, put your own stuff in it, and roll it out. Because there's no standard shape or image for a sync stop. You just take for granted that it's a sync stop. So what happens in October every year in our industry? Anyone? Security awareness. Yep, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Do you know how much stuff SANS sends out? You all have been given social engineering devices and toolkits today. You can brand stuff with this. This is trusted, right? These are security professionals. It's SANS, right? So if you're sitting back at your office in October and a large package comes in with SANS posters, backpacks, stickers, and sync stops, your information security department's going to go out and install it on all the machines, on all the computers, in all of your office, and the information security department will own the business for you. All of us in this room are susceptible to this stuff and could be victims of this. So never think that IT security, we're above anyone else. We're the number one target, and we're probably the worst people because of our arrogance in this industry. But using a familiar channel, all the packaging was there. SANS puts out all those posters. It's Security Awareness Month. It's legitimate. It came from SANS. Why wouldn't you plug them in and use them? So the phishing platform I like to use, keeping with our theme of familiarity, is iTunes. How many of you actually poked into iTunes recently and seen how much it's changed since 1998? Most of the code originally is still there. The great thing about iTunes is you can send a gift to someone and you can do one of those little messages. What's great is in the message box, Apple doesn't filter anything at all. If you want cross-site scripting, if you want other fun stuff, go ahead. It does not filter. It lets it all go through. How many of you are actually filtering out information and messages and emails from iTunes and Apple? That's going to sneak right through. And it's really great for targeting people at a conference like here again. Hey, you showed up to B-Sides Kansas City. We're sending you a free episode of Game of Thrones. There's all the information. And oh, by the way, here's a little bit of information and a link to never mind it. Because you know what? Your AV didn't pick it up. And your email didn't pick it up and nothing else. And it's, it's, it's totally legit, man. It, it's Apple. Why would Apple send you something bad? This is one of the greatest phishing tools. And they have no plan on fixing this for decades from the sounds of it. So it's fun. But again, you think about it, we're thinking inside the box. This is something you trust. This is something you use. It is whitelisted on several manufacturers already. So we'll use that channel. How many of you have seen these around, these awesome touchscreen code machines? They have to have mandatory Wi-Fi and wireless and network capabilities, which is really awesome. So I'm not advocating anything, but they're interesting to look into. If you have one of these in your break room, do you have any rules in place or firewalls for this? It's amazing what's inside of these machines. A lot of these actually come pretty owned, which is kind of fun too. Uh, it's also fun when your Coke machine in the break room starts mining cryptocurrency. <laughs> so, start looking around your break room. Those things that you have in your break room or in your office are attack channels. Think of how much space is in there. That's more than 30% of space in there. That's like the wall. That's worlds of fun to me. That's oceans of fun to me, man. I'm going to have some fun there. So we start thinking about all these crazy things around us. And you start seeing that we have to think a little bit differently, but we don't think outside the box. We think with the box, because that's how we get the Trojan horse in. That's how the Trojan horse works. We've gotten so far away from it by thinking outside the box and other gimmicks, we don't test the core human conditions that we need to, to have a successful security program. We always screw up in security, and we forget that security is a non-tangible construct. And it is different from each person to person, and more importantly, it is a human condition and thing. And we stray away from that a lot and get too technical. By embracing that and looking into things, we start seeing these little systems throughout that can be exploited. Like, how many of you have worked on the help desk? How many of you have that one person at the beginning of the month that for the love of anything holy cannot change and accept that password? And it changes every month, the same time, same place. You understand things like that, and you can exploit that system against it on the red team side. 
Same way with all the hardware out there. We have all this cool gadgetry and cool stuff out there now. We have phones that do all sorts of stuff. I remember when I was a kid, I was told the whole room about this size was one day going to fit a computer. Now it fits in here. The horrible thing about this is this is convenient. And once things are convenient, we overlook them. Just like security. If we don't make security convenient and usable, people will overlook it and go other ways. So, what's something I could use to attack everyone in this room at a conference? And here's now where we're getting into the zero day attack. Uh, I will preface this, this will not harm anyone's phones. This is a mobile based attack. This attack has not been fixed and cannot be fixed. Apple is the only manufacturer that listened and fixed things because this directly impacts something pretty uh, important to them. So, I have a background of graphic design and marketing and all sorts of horrible stuff like you've seen from earlier. I made packaging when I did Cyber Raid and attacked everyone for this contest at the first B Science Kansas City. So I thought I'd go full circle again, but it's Kansas City, so everyone who knows me, I gotta go crazy. This cannot be blocked by Android or Windows phones. If you have RFID enabled or NFC capabilities on your Android phone, this is a Samsung Galaxy S8. It is fully patched. There is no vendor or developer mode or debug enabled. This is a business card. I simply hold the business card up to the phone. Efforts unlocked. And it automatically shows me to a YouTube video. Which, before we get into anything else, all of you can test out here because I've printed a bunch of these up for everyone to test. Here's where the lawyer wants me to reiterate everything a bazillion different times. It is also listed on the card, too. This card demonstrates the technology and attack, and I want you all to have these so you can take them back to your offices and go, hey, you know what, do we have a mobile phone policy? Do we have a mobile device policy? Is that an important thing to you? Oh, it isn't? Well, watch this. What we can do with these now, I can install music on your phone. I can send you to a website. I can add contacts to your phone. And more importantly, I can install apps. The best thing is, there is no authentication, no authorization, nothing. You simply wave this in front of the phone that is enabled, and it triggers. Well, why is that important to Red Team Guy? How can I actually use that to show impact to you as a client and test? And how is this attack relevant? Well, we go out to a conference like here. How many of you have talked to vendors today? How many of you have seen those little fish bowls full of cards? How many of you are at DEF CON this summer? 700 cards were distributed at DEF CON, like this, but DEF CON, they sponsored or uh, reported a party that was going to happen this year. With the metrics we collected at DEF CON this year, on average, each card was scanned 12 times in a 24-hour period because people would show others how it worked and it was so cool. <laughs> so you can have a plan on that as well. So, what would be something even bigger and better than just having business cards? Well, we developed the same technology and we're now doing RFID-based inks. Where that comes into play is we can print letters. And ladies, we are working on nail polish. So you can have door access on fingers based upon polish. But what's something you could use to attack someone like at a hacker conference? Or what's something you could show at work even further to really bring in the impact of, you know what, should probably have a mobile device policy, should probably have a policy covering conferences and conduct. We're at a hacker conference, right? What's, what's unique about a hacker conference? Anyone? 
stickers. Yeah. <laughs> Techno music. So wouldn't it be cool? She had a sticker. And you had a sticker up, and all you had to do is pass the phone by it, and it would trigger. This is an RFID. What we did with these, which all these I want you guys to come up and take some, because I want you to take these back to your workplace and show that, hey, we got to get on the policy train. We got to adapt and change technologies. This is NFC. We're stepping up the game. The stickers are NFC, so we have a lot more capabilities of things that we can do. I can't talk about that today. <laughs> but all these are great for you guys to go out and test. The stickers and these cards both go to a YouTube video where you can watch Bob the Ninja talk about stuff. That way it's benign, and yes, again, I have to reiterate by the lawyers that it is benign. It does not go to anywhere. There is no executables. There is no data transfer of uh, binaries, etc. You simply watch a YouTube video. That way when you pass this off to folks at your workplace, there's a little bit of comfort and you can show them like, hey, this is, this is bad. This is not the nerds screaming the sky is falling. This is that we can take a business card now and attack you. So what's another thing that we can do with these? This technology now. Where is somewhere you go where you pass off a cell phone to someone and they hold it up against something. Airport. Airport ticketing gates. It's very easy to get a, a mechanism like that into place. So you start thinking about places where people relinquish their phones and surrender things. These attacks take on a whole new order. Or you can run around today and have a lot of fun with them and show them to people, you know, and go, hey, why don't you take a selfie with me? Or I'll take your selfie, watch this. The scary thing is, is that there's no authentication mechanisms on this at all. You saw this is fully patched Samsung. Android has to redo everything at a kernel level, and Windows phones, people need to start using them, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so what we do, though, is once I use this card at, say, this environment, I would put the contact of help desk into your phone. So that way, when I call you on a phishing pretext, it's totally legit because the help test number popped up. Or I would take your friend's numbers and modify them by one digit or something. Or put my phone number in your friend's contacts. Or what's the most used contact that you have in your phone? I will find that and we'll add and change things accordingly. But this is scary because it opens up new attack avenues and new ways of thinking and new ways of trying things and the fact that manufacturers won't fix it. Apple was the only one that did because this ties closely into Apple Pay and Apple Wallet, all the NFC transfers and the RFID stuff that they do. It ties way close into Apple Pay, so they quickly fixed everything here. You cannot do this on any iOS device, period. The technology and everything, the way they've done and how you can allocate um, libraries to the hardware level, you can't do. We tried a lot, because we really thought it'd be cool to have iOS uh, zero day for that. So one of the quick things here is where do you even start with all this stuff? I'm kind of throwing everything at the wall at you, kind of showing you some of the things that we do day in, day out to break into places. I talk about policies a lot. I always mention the P word, people hate policies. If policies are boring and inhibiting your production and your process and flow of security, you're doing it wrong. These are your marching orders for the field. This tells you how to load your gun, rack everything, and start firing. They are not anything that should be used to delay, retard, or slow your security process. They're supposed to be, if that guy gets hit by the bus tomorrow, or this guy over here wins the lottery, how do we keep on moving? How do we keep on functioning and marching? That's what policies need to be. Because there's all this stuff now. You didn't think about this this morning. You don't have a policy for this, and it's stupid to write a policy directly for this, but if you write a policy that says, hey guys, if you go to a conference, especially some hacker conference, please don't bring anything back into this room or house or anything or business or whatever. Leave it at home. It's cool. Go ahead and do it. But we just don't want it at work. If it plugs into something, for the love of all things holy, please don't bring it in the office and plug it in. Leave it at home. 
Your end users and people need that information. They need that feedback. And they need that education because this stuff changes all the time. If you're teaching your people to don't click stuff, that's stupid. That's how we do everything and achieve everything in computers, is I click something and it's cool and it happens. You have to educate users directly, give them information to march with. Also do radio frequency scans. All this stuff that I show you emits radio frequencies. All this stuff would trip that out. Radio frequency scanners are very dirt cheap, uh, very affordable. Go to Micro Center here in town and find stuff, but scan that. But the most important thing is scan, uh, educate your employees to look for stuff. Report stuff. Be aware of things. They are a target. Everyone in this room is now a target. We are a resource that can be harvested. So real quickly, we're going to get into the blue team side of things. How do we fix all this stuff? Uh, physical security side, does it, uh, everyone know what this is? It's an under door hook. So what this does is we slide it under a door. It hooks the other side, the handle on the other side. We pull the cable and it opens the door. Again, we take basically the origins of this is a realtor sign and piano wire. Again, just taking things around the office, around your normal everyday life, you can utilize them in different ways. <clears throat> but this allows us to open a door from the other side if it's not properly shielded. Since you guys are all at conferences here and traveling, and you might be at a hotel, here's two ways to protect yourself against this if you're traveling. One, simply roll up a, a towel or a washcloth and put it in the handle like so. That way, my hook under the door can't hook that handle down and pull it down. It also provides resistance so that handle can't pull down. Item on the left is a wedge. They're very lightweight, they're rubber, they're great for hotel doors, you can wedge it in. If someone throws that door open, it starts digging in deeper. That's great for if you're protecting yourself physically. What about the power situation? Bring your own batteries. You should be doing so anyways as part of modern life, the way that these things suck down power. Roll your own power, take it with you. Do not ever plug into anything in public. Because you saw, we can roll out our own battery chargers, we can roll out our own phone chargers at the airport. We can put stuff in the wall. Have your employees check something out or use a controlled power source. There is no room in there to do any kind of shenanigans. Those batteries are tight. They use all available space. The other thing is you can start protecting your assets such as RFID badges. There is now several RFID badge protectors that allow you to shield and prevent them from being cloned, read, or stolen. This is now especially important since the advent of the Apple Watches. We're now using the Apple Watches instead of Proxmarks to do most of our badging in there. It also allows us to get in smaller and closer to you so we can steal stuff. I love these things. These are cheap. What these are is RFID shielding bags. If you're going to DEF CON, buy these. What these are for is in forensics and stuff, we put equipment into it so radio frequencies will not escape. So if I seize your laptop on a RAID, we can put it in here. It ensures that nothing changes from the time that we seized your laptop to the point that forensics gets a hold of it and starts playing with it. We can make sure that all your radio frequencies, everything you were doing, your wireless, everything was not touched. For the rest of us, if we put this in there, no one's going to scan it. No one's going to be able to access it because it's a little portable Faraday cage. These things are like five to nine dollars. If you're in a pinch, you can use tin foil or a mylar balloon, the party balloons. Those work very good too. Having these RFID shield bags are great. They make them for your laptops, cell phones, everything else. In modern day life, please start using these. You leak out so much frequencies and signals and things in your modern life, you don't realize it. Plus, if you're going to hacker conferences, you should probably be using these. So, Again, I stated earlier, I want you guys to have these three tools. Both the stickers and the cards I want you guys to take today. Come up here, help yourselves, take them with you, and run around with them, try them out, and show other people. The reason I want you to do that is we can tell stories so many times about dropping the USB stick in the parking lot. We can tell silly stories about things, and it doesn't matter. If you walk in tomorrow and show that, hey, I can do this with this, I owned your cell phone with a business card. 
This is next level Scorpion CSI cyber stuff, okay? But it's for real. And then you can do it yourself. So I want you guys to all take these after this talk and go out and try this. But more importantly, use these to help educate people that the technologies around us are cool, but convenience is the enemy. Take a closer look. Look at what's under your desk. Like Monday morning, I challenge everyone to go look what's under your desk. Open that rat trap up and see what's there, if it actually is rat food. Start looking around you. There is so much stuff that everyone can use around the world to attack everyone that it almost makes you scared, but it also makes you more motivated to start going through your policies to make sure your program's actually working and that your security defenses are actually working. So again, don't treat it like the P word. Policies are your marching orders. Those are your instructions for combat and they shouldn't be taken lightly. And alongside with all these cards and stickers, if you guys have any questions about this, I suffer from insomnia, I don't sleep around the clock, and many people in this room can confirm that. I'm available for uh, reaching out, answering questions of any sort, any type, any time. Uh, we do Hacker Hired, which we help people find jobs in IT and information security. Uh, the hashtag's there. We also help recruiters find uh, people as well. And we teach a lot of social engineering. So, any questions? So, can QR codes kind of be used in similar to NFC? A QR code still requires like a uh, interaction of me scanning and interacting with the. Sure. the people love them and will scan it regardless. Of but you you still have to interact with it, whether it's the card. Basically, they created a promotional channel for Android, Windows. BlackBerry hardware. That developer hardware channel was going to be able to allow you to do all sorts of cool things like this RFID, NFC stuff, or you could use uh, theater lighting protocols. There's all this stuff that was supposed to happen and it never transpired. Well, uh, follow up question too, like regarding wireless charging and probably becoming more prevalent in wireless charging. Awesome. Oh, no. That's yeah, it's. Uh, I, I couldn't give the talk on that 100% here, but what I can tell you is if you're using wireless charging, you're more uh, susceptible to just like the convenience of, oh, this dude here has a mat, I'm just going to set it down there. But you're putting an antenna on your phone at the end of the day. And there's very little on the modern construction that you can do to bridge that so it's now broadcasting and receiving and some other fun stuff. But no, the, and one of your stickers could easily be made to look. No, uh, no, we ran into that. That's why we did the <laughs> NFC. <laughs> the NFC allowed us to read and write and maintain some odds and ends, but going down that road, there's 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 some design things that we ran into that was a problem. Okay, the phone on the card proximity, that's still an issue for attacks, because we're not gonna release the several feet away because that's no fair and fun. Average is about uh, three to six inches is the greatest. So usually from about here to here, about here is the biggest way out. Three to six inches out, it depends on the phone. Nexus, we've had different results from. A pardon? Yes. Yeah, because you're doing that too. Uh, also, conferences, where you have your mobile app for conferences like RSA this week, which they have problems. Yeah, you're you're actively going around and scanning and putting this near stuff you're doing, so it wouldn't be much for this guy to have this badge hanging off his shirt. You could scan my phone for the conference. There's all sorts of attack vectors. I mean, it just really opens up to. Inform your employees first to be aware of the, you know, attacks can come in all shapes and sizes. Let's just be careful when we leave the office. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, like elevator speech, like missing people out of the chain seems to be like, uh, I would sound paranoid. I would say this. So, what, two things I did is one, I used things that were real relevant to me at the time growing up. I'm a Scottish person who can't go to save his life. But I can go to your seat level executives and use golf as an analogy. You know, 
we really need that fireball. I get it, it's 30K. And all you hear is blah, 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 the nerds are talking, and blah, 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 the paranoid one new nerd toys. However, you can sit there and use the analogy of, you know what, you see the new Cobra drivers? Damn, they're awesome. They're going to shave at least you know, three points off your golf game. Why, why don't you go get that? Why don't you go get that now, you know, shave points off your golf game with that driver? But you know what? That Palo Alto, that's your driver. But it's even better. Because not only does it shave points off your game, it's going to allow your bot to get out in the field and play golf more. Instead of the clubhouse bragging to everyone else that I can golf all damn day because my people handle this with the right equipment. Using analogies that speak at their level or put stuff that does not speak down to them is critical. So that they can actually understand, like, oh, I'm shaving points off my golf game with a good driver. If I actually support the security guys and stuff, I'm shaving points off my compliance. The other thing is just simply making sure that you're watching the vernacular and what you're doing. Uh, Emily Post, I would read Emily Post books, Anders and stuff. There's some little things in there that can help you really find the latch point in the conversation. The other thing is hit it back to money. So I always have a problem with incident response of like how do we get management to any kind of traction with incident response? Break it down to a dollar value. So if this guy here clicks that one link for phishing and he's got ransomware and his computer's offline, we break everything down to a dollar value of this guy's out of work for the day, that guy's out of work for the day because he has to find a loaner laptop, he has to back everything up, you're out of work for the day because you have to help coordinate it, you answer the call, and you have to figure out what's on the machine and how to get rid of it. At the bare minimum, you have three people's salaries for the day that you can quantitate a value and go, hey, three people's salaries for the day, done, because this one dude clicked this one link. You can start pulling things back at a dollar value and showing people through activities and relating it to salaries, such as that dude has clicked this every month. We're quantitatively at you know, 168K. Why is that guy still working here? We've exceeded his value at the company. You and I don't think that way, but once management starts sitting there going, you know what, every time this dude clicks this one link, that costs me 10K and loss of productivity and loss of projects for the day, things change. And we are so arrogant. We all in this room are very arrogant in this community, and we do things incorrectly. Because we always assume, we always take things a different direction. We need to humble our asses out, understand that there is always a problem. The problem never goes away because as long as there's a human involved with the system, every one of us in this room will have a job. And that has to be communicated and worked with. So when it comes to management, you can't find a way to use an analogy. If that doesn't work and you have problems where people are minimizing you and marginalizing your ideas, find another channel. If they marginalize your ideas, create something that you can demo to them and go, look, we're not crazy nerds, you know, with conspiracy theories. This ain't QAnon. Here you go. You have to take some time to study your people. You should use OSINT on your management. Why haven't you done recon on your management? Recon your management. Figure out how they work. What do they like? Maybe you have to use Chicago Bears as an analogy. Or you have to use WMBA as an analogy. Whatever it is, figure out an analogy and figure out the common ground. Any other questions? Oh. You said you were playing around with the distance for the NFC. Did you, what was the maximum distance? NFC is a little different right now. With these guys, as small as they are, this is about probably two to three inches max with the stickers. We're working on some things down the road. And the cards were RFID? Cards are RFID. About three to six inches, that varies on the phone. But it depends on if you have a case on it and all these other factors. The safe thing to say is we plan about an inch to three inches where we plan for an operation. So if I need to engage them somehow, my pretext needs to be at least one to three inches max. So maybe like I can toss it in the fishbowl at the table at his vendor booth. Well, that's cool, but we have a slight probability he will take it home and interact with it. It's far enough distance that in that fishbowl, if I set my phone down on the table, it won't be affected. We are working on some changes, but there are limitations to the actual how RFID and NFC works. It's prohibiting us from really getting crazy. And if you wanted to learn more about uh, creating an RFID, similar to 
you have any, any resources? Working on it. Um, <laughs> we're actually going to be rolling out our website so we're going to put the ourselves. So blogs, everything else, we've been kind of keeping things under wraps. Uh, there's some other things coming out too that will help. If you're interested on this and other red team tools, there will be a massive resource probably by DEF CON time. It will be, be available through some other resources. So we want to make sure that we, all the crazy stuff that we do is now available more widespread. Thank you. Yes. If you want to apply the basic framework of forensics to things just as you would with malware, you're still tracking how the jump off point called the website or resource. I'm talking about finding the cards. So, alright, okay. the risk is the bad consequence you got it, a uh, vulnerability you got it. It depends because if you're trying to track back down, say if you want to know that I'm the guy who made this. Right. So you're only going to be looking at three manufacturers of sticker labels that are available. On top of that, you're looking at only one manufacturer that manufactures the hardware for the NFC. At uh, forensics level, uh, court order will get you that real quick from the manufacturer. Yeah, you trace it back to oh, yeah. The yeah, I can't really order these be anonymous like I normally like to, but with the components. Mainly because they're so rare and there's a very limited pipeline of things. So you start going and doing shenanigans with this, people will catch up to you eventually. Uh, also, they leave artifacts when you're doing stuff and directing people. So if I send you to a website, it's generating <coughs> artifacts. The install log, coincidentally, for the Android and everything else is just the same. Just like you would with an app. Same way with the music. The only things that we found on uh, in the past that doesn't work is when it adds the contacts and stuff. We don't always see log values written, and that depends on which phone and operating system. But that's really the thing I hate about Android is there's so many different flavors of hardware and the OS. I can't really nail things down. That's really what I wanted to with like the distances. I wanted a distance where I could tell you all this far, everything. But the Nexus is different from the Samsungs, which is different from everything else. Basically, it, you want their uh, antenna to not be impeded on the back side as much as possible. With the forensics, there's plenty in place. There's actually folks that have actually looked into this too. If you guys are wanting to know how to identify these, if you get a business card from me, you can hold it up to the light. You can bend it. You can break it. You can tear it in half, and it's just paper. With these guys, if you hold them up to the light, you'll see some of the mechanisms like the RFID coil or the antenna in here. You can feel around, they don't bend as easy, and there's something inside of it. The stickers we made intentionally so you can hold them up to the light and you can see everything inside of them. So with the stickers, I did not want to be permanently banned from every hacking conference ever, and I did not want to be run out of town by y'all. So we made sure that these could be detected and seen, and you hold them up to the light, you can see the mechanism in them. You've got some leeway. Because we hand out stickers all the time too, we didn't want you guys to murder us. We also made these a little similar to the Mr. Yuck stickers for those in the 70s and 80s that would call that. So you can run around and have fun sticking these on things and warn people about NFC and RFID problems. Any other questions? And if you guys want to, reach out to me anytime, any place. I always answer a crazy question and stuff. So. Well, let's, let's, let's,